After the defeat of Leonidas's army, the Persians were now completely free to invade Phocis, Boeotia, and Attica. The Persian horde, guided by the Thessalians, wreaked havoc throughout Phocis, while the Phocians themselves were able to avoid capture by retreating on top of Mount Parnassus. The invaders overran the whole of Phocis, burning and destroying everything in their path. Towns and cities were torched, temples were plundered and women were violated. The Persian king wanted to send a message to all Greeks that dared to stand before him. Resist me at your peril. Herodotus here gives us a rather fanciful story about a detachment of Persians that attempted to raid the temple at Delphi, and how the temple of the famous oracle was eventually spared destruction by unexplainable forces and self-guided weapons. This could be a further indication of the temple's compliance, and maybe even collaboration with the Persians during their invasion, but there's no actual historical proof to further support this. While the Persian army was advancing through Phocis and Boeotia, the Greek fleet that retreated from Artemisium arrived at Salamis. The Athenians believed that they would find the whole allied army in Boeotia, but learned that the Peloponnesian allies intended to fortify the Isthmus of Corinth and defend the Peloponnese itself, leaving everything else, including the city of Athens, at the mercy of the Persian invaders. Thus, the Athenians entreated the allied fleet to gather around Salamis, so that they could safely evacuate their women and children from the city, and moreover take counsel as to what they should do next, since there wasn't an agreed course of action for the Greek coalition after the setback at Thermopylae. The council of the Greek coalition was held soon afterwards at Salamis. Eriobiades, the Spartan leader of the allied fleet, laid the matter before them. Things were looking bleak for the Greeks, making a final stand on Attica was deemed out of the question, due to the relatively open topography and the extreme numerical superiority of the Persians. It was believed that the narrow stretch of land around Megara would have been easily defendable, and if the fleet was defeated, the survivors could fall back on the Peloponnese and defend the Isthmus. On the other hand, if they made their last stand around Salamis, then in case of defeat they would all have been trapped on an island where no help could come to them. While the Greek allies were arguing about strategic matters, an Athenian man came bearing news that the invaders were laying waste to Attica. Xerxes had marched his army through the medized Boeotia which was left largely unharmed, while burning Plataea and Thespia, having been informed by the Thebans that they were the only two cities that resisted him. Soon afterwards the huge host arrived outside the walls of Athens, burning and destroying the countryside around the city. By that stage, Athens looked like a ghost city, streets were empty, houses were shut, and the occasional bark of a dog or the chirp of birds broke the eerie silence of the desolate streets. Yet the city was not completely abandoned. A small force of Athenians who could not afford the passage to Salamis, and others who interpreted the Delphic wooden wall prophecy in a more literal way, had barricaded themselves on the Acropolis, behind a wooden palisade made out of doors and timber. And there, at the gateway, prepared to defend themselves and the temples. Even though many of them were impoverished, it is safe to assume that they were all well equipped, because they could have used the war trophies dedicated to the temples. The invading force marched through the abandoned streets, and soon reached the foothills of the Acropolis. The Persians established their command post on the hill, over against the Acropolis, known as the Hill of Eris, and besieged the small band of Athenian defenders. A detachment of Persians was sent to attack the barricade head-on, but the defenders put up a stout resistance, rolling great stones down on the charging force, eventually fending them off in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The Persians, were now understandably wary, of hand-to-hand -hand combat with hoplites in a narrow space, after their experience at Thermopylae, and switched tactics. Archers were called forth and showered the Greek positions with arrows wrapped in lighted tow, in the hope that the wooden palisade would burst in flames. Despite all of their efforts, the Persian commanders were unable to dislodge the Greeks from their positions, and so, Pisistratid exiles who accompanied the Persian army, were sent to offer terms of surrender. 
A brief exchange ensued between the exiles and the Athenians, but the defenders of Acropolis remained adamant. There would be no surrender. Facing the exact same situation that he did during the first day of Thermopylae, Xerxes was running out of options. The position seemed impregnable, and a direct frontal charge uphill seemed suicidal, even against amateurs. Eventually, a Persian assault group found a way around the gateway, at the opposite end of the Acropolis. The area was completely undefended, because nobody thought that any human could climb up to it, due to its steepness. It was a grave mistake, because as soon as the area was identified by the assault group, the most agile Persians managed to make this climb. When the Greek defenders realized that they were being attacked from the rear by Persians who had scaled the Acropolis, they were caught completely off guard. There was no one defending the eastern side of the fortifications. Fearing that the flanking Persians were part of a much larger attacking group, they panicked and immediately abandoned their positions, leaving the gateway unguarded and open to assault. The surviving Greek defenders retreated in the temple's inner chamber, while the flanking force signaled the rest of the Persian army to storm, the now vacated gateway. The small trickle of invaders became a flood, and soon thousands of Persians were roaming the Acropolis. The storming Persian soldiers now had little difficulty breaking inside the last refuge of the Greek defenders. After a brief but bitter struggle, the hopelessly outnumbered Greeks stood no chance, and were killed to the last man. The Acropolis was finally captured, and the marauding Persians plundered the shrine, and set fire to all the buildings. Athens had fallen. And now the only thing that was standing between the Persian invaders, and the complete annihilation of Greek civilization, was the wooden walls of Themistocles. As the fire was spreading around the temples of the Acropolis, brightening up the night sky, a few miles to the south of the coast of Salamis, the Greek fleet was preparing to face, the mightiest navy of the ancient world. If you liked the video please comment, share, like, and subscribe. This is the best way that you can help the channel grow. You can also consider helping me on Patreon. See you, next time.